Hey guys, welcome to part 2 of the Introduction to the Cycles Node Editor mini course. In this video, we'll be going over different ways to organize nodes, as well as a few extra nodes to contribute to your knowledge. So let's start off by talking about a few different ways that we can organize nodes in our node editor. I went ahead and created a new material from another random image texture off of my computer, following the same exact guidelines that we went over in the last video. I threw the material onto a sphere, and this is what it looks like. You're welcome to copy my exact node setup, however I would like to encourage you to try and create your own material as well and follow along with that instead. The reason I say this is because since we're just talking about organization, you don't have to have the exact same node setup that I have. You'll just be able to organize your own nodes in your own way. Anyway, as your node tree becomes more and more complex, it'll become bigger and bigger because you'll have a lot more nodes to work with. Fortunately, there's a really easy way to shrink these nodes down into something that's a little bit more reasonable. If we select a node that has multiple inputs or outputs that aren't connected to anything and press Ctrl H, these extraneous inputs and outputs will vanish completely. This makes our node a lot smaller and a lot easier to work with because we only have to focus on the inputs and outputs that we're actually using. Now just because these inputs and outputs aren't visually there doesn't mean that they aren't still affecting the node. Hidden inputs and outputs will still affect data just as they would if they were there, you just can't see them. If you'd like to access these inputs and outputs again, you can just press Ctrl H again and they'll reappear. And then if you want to hide them again, Ctrl H again. Now this is a really great feature and it makes things a lot smaller, however, sometimes it's still not small enough. That's why there's this little arrow in the upper left corner of every single node. If you click this arrow, the node will shrink down into something just the size of the title bar. It is so useful and it makes things so much more compact, plus you still have all of your inputs and outputs available for your access. Now of course in Blender there is a shortcut for everything, so the shortcut to do this instead of having to click the arrow is to press the H key with the node selected. So this basically just does the same exact thing, except it's a lot quicker and a lot easier. We can actually combine these two different methods to make like an ultra small micro node thing. For example, our texture coordinate node is absolutely huge, so if we hide both our extraneous outputs and we shrink the node down, well, voila, we have a tiny node coming from what was once an absolutely huge node. Now that is what I call node organization. So we now know how to compress single nodes into smaller spaces, but what about having crazy lines everywhere? I'm sure all of us have seen those node trees that are just giant clusters of wires going left and right and up and down and every single which way and there's no way to possibly follow them. But fortunately we've got the awesome Blender developers on our side who already found a solution to this problem using these little tools called reroutes. To add a reroute to your scene, press Shift A, which pulls up our add menu. Go down to the bottom to the layouts tab and select reroute off the menu. It should add a little dot, just like the dots on our nodes. We can use these reroutes to change the direction that the connections between our nodes use. For example, if I wanted to take the color output of my mix node and plug it straight into my diffuse node, typically it would have to cut straight through my hue saturation value node. But what I can do instead is place two reroutes above my hue saturation value node, connect my color output from my mix node into the first reroute, connect the first reroute into the second reroute, and then connect the second reroute into the color input of our diffuse shader. In this particular situation, it really doesn't do too much. We could have just moved the hue saturation value node out of the way, but as your projects become more complicated, reroutes become much more useful. In this case, since we don't really need the reroutes, I'm actually just going to delete them and then hook our hue saturation value node back up to our diffuse input. So if you paid really close attention to when we added those reroutes, you notice there was one other thing in our layouts category, and those are called the frames. Let's go ahead and add a frame to our scene. You can see we get this little gray box. What frames allow us to do is organize nodes into different sections. So if I want to put all of my inputs into one general big node, I can move them into a frame. So I'll move the frame over here, I'll select our three inputs, and then I'll press G to pick them up, and then I'll click inside of our frame, and voila, the frame now snaps around the nodes, and if we move the frame, all of our nodes move with it. Let's do the same thing for our operator nodes. We'll add another frame, select our three operator nodes, and move them inside of that frame. Now we can position them accordingly. 
And I'm not going to bother with making a frame for our output node since it is just one node. Inside of each frame, we can still adjust nodes just as we would if they were outside of the frame. It just makes it a little bit easier for us to see visually. So you'll see that in both of our frames here, they have a frame written up at the top and we can change this to something more desirable. So if we press N, we can open up this little side menu and we can type the name we want in the label box. So in this case, I'll type in input because this is our input nodes. So now you can see it says input up at the top here. We can do the same thing with our operator nodes here. So we'll type the label in as operator. And now we have an operator frame. So it's a, it's a really good way to keep track of whatever you're working on. And this gets to be especially helpful uh, when you're working with procedural textures. Additionally, we can check this little color box down below where it says label, and we can actually assign a color to each frame. So we can make the frame blue or yellow or whatever color we could possibly think of. And even better, we can also put different frames inside of bigger frames. So we can make a frame of frames, if that makes any sense. And then we can do all the same things with it. So I'll name this one everything and give it a color. I don't know what color, we'll make it black. You can make it black, um, but we'll just leave it as this grayish color. Now, when you want to remove something from a frame, you can't just click and drag it out because as you can see here, the frame just adapts to accommodate it. What you have to do is you have to press Alt P and pressing Alt P will free whatever you were using. So this works with frames inside of frames or individual nodes as well. So you can see I can press Alt P here, it becomes separate and then we can move it out of the way. If we wanna get rid of a frame altogether, we can just press the X button and the contents inside of the frame won't be affected. So you can see I can just delete these two and nothing will happen. So I'll just reorganize my setup here into something that makes sense. And that also reminds me about the snapping tool. Down here at the bottom, we have this little magnet icon. If we click it and enable it so it's orange, our nodes will snap to the grid. So you can see that they move around at intervals. Or we can press shift tab, which does the same thing and you can see that it's now no longer snapping. Press shift tab again and it snaps. Whenever I'm working in the node editor, I usually have the snapping tool on just because it makes things so much easier to work with and it keeps things at nice, clean, organized intervals that you don't really have to worry about. So that about sums up all of the important organizational tools in the node editor. So let's go ahead and take a look at some more nodes. That way we can expand your node knowledge. That should be, a, that should be the catchphrase for this thing. Expand your node knowledge. Anyway, we'll start by looking at our texturing nodes. If we press Shift A to open up our add menu and go down to the textures category, we have a big list of textures. Most of these are procedural textures, which means that they are derived from some sort of algorithm, right? So you can plug in any sort of coordinate, any sort of number into these, and they'll give you a completely different texture following the same general guidelines. So let's start off by looking at our noise texture. I'm going to go ahead and add a noise texture node to our node editor. I'm going to disconnect and completely delete everything else in this scene except for our noise texture, diffuse shader, and our material output. And then I'm going to connect the color output from our noise texture into the color input of our diffuse BSDF shader. Now in our viewport, we can begin to see the texture taking shape. So let's go ahead and play around with the settings of our noise texture. We'll start by playing around with scale. If we make the scale larger, if, well, it's, if it's minute, it doesn't do much, but if we change it up, you can see that it starts to become a lot smaller and a lot more colorful. If we change it down, it becomes almost one solid color. So we'll leave it at five. We can also change the detail and it's hard to see what detail does here, but it basically creates a lot of tiny minute changes in color uh, between all the different color layers. And then we also have distortion, which more or less just distorts our image. So you can see something around five just adds a bunch of big loops. And if we change it up to a higher number, it becomes a lot more densely packed until we get up to something like a thousand. Oops, to, there you go. In which it just becomes solid blue because it's so distorted that it's just an average of all colors. So we'll change this back to zero. And now let's go ahead and hook up the factor output from our noise texture into the color input of our diffuse BSDF. Now you may think to yourself, wait a second, you're hooking up a numerical value output into a color input. How does that work? Well, well, I guess you can kind of see it on the right here. You can see that our sphere is now made up of black and white instead of the colors. And that's more or less what happens when you use a numerical value as a color input. It just interprets that as color data. So basically what's happening behind the scenes here is that the factor output is giving a bunch of numbers in according to different coordinates, right? So at a single coordinate, right? 
and I'll have a random value between zero and one. Zero is interpreted as black, and one is interpreted as white. So if the, uh, if the sphere has a spot on it that's more black, that means that the value of that individual spot is closer to zero. And if it has an area that's closer to white, that area is going to be closer to one. So that's kind of how the color input interprets a factor or a numerical value input. Anyway, you can see that our data is appearing on our sphere here, and if we change the settings over here, such as scale or detail, which detail you can see here, or um, also distortion, you can see that it updates onto our sphere. All of Blender's texturing nodes follow the same general structure as this noise node where it has a bunch of different inputs and then it has a either color and factor or just factor output. I'm not going to go over all of them in this video because again they're more or less the same, just different textures come out of them. However, if you'd like to experiment with them, I totally encourage that. So I'm assuming that most of you who are watching this video are familiar with the material editor that Blender has over here in its properties menu. And by assuming that, I'm also assuming that you've toyed around with some of Cycle's shaders, some of the basic ones such as the glossy shader or the, the glass shader or other similar ones, maybe even the tune shader if you got into that. If you have no idea what I'm talking about, I'd recommend clicking the little card in the upper right corner of the screen right now. It'll take you to a video that very briefly explains shaders and gives you some examples, and then you can come back to this video and watch the rest of it without having any confusion. So in the node editor, we can actually add all of these different shaders. You can see that in this current setup, we have a diffuse BSDF shader, right? That's what that is. It's a, it's a shader node. So let's go ahead and try out a different shader. In this case, let's add a glossy shader. So we'll press Shift A, go down to our shader category, and we can see a big list of different shaders that we can use. And let's, let's select the glossy shader off that list. I'm going to drop it right below our diffuse shader, hook up the color input, and then hook up the output to our material output node. We'll also hook the color up to our diffuse shader input. As you can see, our sphere is now broadcasting the glossy shader instead of the diffuse shader. It looks a lot different, doesn't it? And that's because we're using a completely different shader. Basically what shaders do is they define how light reacts to the surface of our mesh. We can also tweak the roughness setting, which on the diffuse shader we also have a roughness setting, but it really doesn't do much. Tweaking the roughness setting on our glossy shader makes a big difference. It goes from being a very clean reflection to a very distorted and foggy reflection. Roughness is definitely something we'll be looking into a lot more, but I'm not going to go too far into depth with it right now. So let's get a little bit funky. You guys remember the mix RGB node, right? The one that mixed two colors together based on some sort of value? Well, we can do the same thing with shaders, except with a mix shader node. Let's experiment. We can add a mix shader node by pressing Shift A, going down to our shader category, and selecting mix shader off of the list. I'm going to drop it right onto the line connecting our glossy shader with our material output. Remember, this will snap it into place. So when I drop it here, you can see that it automatically snaps, and we'll also connect the diffuse shader into the other shader input on the left side of our mix shader node. By doing so, the shader that appears in our preview window is a mix between the glossy and the diffuse shader. You'll notice that our mix shader node, just like our mix RGB node, has a factor slider on it too. We can slide this factor back and forth to get different outputs. For example, if we slide it all the way to the left, so the value is zero, we see only the first input. If we slide it all the way to the right, or one, we only see the second input. I'm also gonna flip these two around because it's kind of confusing the way they're set up right now because the connections cross. Let's try adding another shader. In this case, let's add an emission shader. I'll drop this right above our mix shader node. Now what I'm planning on doing with this is mixing it again with our mix shader node, but instead of adding a mix shader node, let's add an add shader node. That sounds a little bit funny to say. So we'll add the add shader node from the same menu that our mix shader and all of our other shaders are, and we'll drop it in, and we'll connect our mix shader node to the bottom and the emission shader node to the top. And oh my goodness, our beautiful colorful sphere has suddenly turned white, and it's glowing, and it's bright. And that's because the add shader adds to the existing shader, if that makes any sense. So the mix shader node will say like, oh, it's 50% this and 50% this. Um, whereas the add shader says, oh, well, it's 50% this plus 50% this. So it adds on to what's already there. So it's pretty boring as is. So let's give it a little bit of pizzazz. 
Let's press Shift A, come down to our texture category, and add a Voronoi texture. A Voronoi texture is another one of our procedural textures. We'll drop this right behind our emission shader. We'll then take the factor output of the Voronoi texture and put it into the strength input of our emission shader. Now that's a pretty neat outcome. So let's go ahead and break down this node tree. We start with our noise texture, and that goes into our glossy shader and our diffuse shader. Those get mixed together, and they go into our add shader, and they're mixed with this emission shader. This emission shader's strength is controlled by the factor output of our Voronoi texture. Remember, the factor output is a black and white image, right, with values between 0 and 1. So our black parts of our Voronoi texture do not appear, right, these are the parts where it's still the color, and the white parts of our image are obviously white because the strength is 0 where there is black and the strength is 1 where there is white. And this is added on top of our other shader and then that gets output as our material output. We can also screw with different things in our Voronoi texture, for example the scale. I like this better when it's set to 10 because it looks kind of like bubbles. Uh, it looks like a nice bubbly surface or something like that. Uh, but there's plenty of things that you can do using this method where you plug in the factor of a texture into some other determinant factor of another node. So with that being said, I'm going to leave you guys with a little bit of a challenge. Using nothing but what we went over in this video and some extra texturing nodes, I was able to create a procedural moon. My challenge for you guys is to try and create your own procedural moon using procedural textures. I will tell you that in order to do this, I used one type of procedural texture twice, and then I only used one shader. The question is, can you figure it out? I wish you the best of luck, and I'll reveal my node tree in the next video. Until then, I wish you guys the best of luck in your endeavors, keep being awesome, and keep blending. I'll see you guys later. Adios.